Welcome back everybody. Uh, fun little video here at Blue Glow Electronics today. We're going to be doing the conversion of a Fisher 460A console amplifier as you can see here on the bench. And these units, the 460A and the 440A as well as the 490A are very very similar uh, conversions. They're, I would call them kind of sister amplifiers and so what we do for the 460A uh, is pretty darn close to what you will do for the other two although some slight variations in the schematics and the numbering of things but the, the general gist of it is the same. Um, there's a couple things about these amplifiers that kind of make them not the most desirable um, Fisher console amplifier out there um, sadly but I would say that done properly these are really nice little amplifiers so you know um, I, I can understand their shortcomings but we're going to talk about those today and how to overcome those and uh, if you overcome those shortcomings then this is a great little console amplifier to own and convert and the good thing about them is uh, because of some of these shortcomings these things usually go fairly cheap on eBay um, typically in the 200 to 250 dollar range uh, maybe 300 at the most for one of these whereas the uh, the, the more um, renowned amplifier the SA16 those things get up on into the um, you know 450 500 550 dollar type range for one of those all right let's dive in the first first shortcoming on these amplifiers is that um, these output transformers here are not the largest output transformer you can kind of see here compared to a dollar bill um, you know they're not that big um, the SA16 output transformers are considerably larger and so these transformers coupled with some of the other shortcomings in this amplifier um, have caused um, these output transformers to kind of be known to go out on these amplifiers but the reality is if you fix the other shortcomings um, you'll likely never have any issues with these output transformers and they actually perform and sound quite well so um, we're going to jump over to the schematic to talk about the other shortcomings okay you can see here on an art, uh, a forum post I found on Audio Karma guy says first of all the 460A tends to eat OPTs I've had two fail on two different amps make sure your tubes are well matched and your caps and resistors are in good uh, shape all right, I made a little curriculum here of what we're going to go through today. I've already talked about there are some schematic variations. Uh, it's more like a resistor may be called R123 on one schematic and R129 on another. Um, and so you kind of have to know that <laughs> and pay attention to the schematics. Um, but in general, though, these are the same amplifiers. They just happen to come in different models of consoles and um, they give them a different model number because of that. And some of them run 12... AX7s in the front end and others run the 7247. So there's some slight differences, but the modifications we're talking about in this unit are pretty much the same. The second one, <clears throat> the all four of the output tubes in this amplifier share a common cathode um, bias. And so you need to have well-matched tubes across all four, uh, a matched quad of tubes in this amplifier. And if you don't, it can that can be part of your issues and causing problems with these output transformers. Um, up next, the output tube bias. Let's jump over to a schematic and look at that. Okay, so if you search for schematic, um, you may not find one for the 440A or 460A. What you really need to be searching for is the uh, Fisher Electra console, and uh, that's what this thing would have looked like. Um, but inside of that, you will find buried the actual schematic for uh, for this unit and if we scroll down here eventually we'll get to the schematic diagram for the amplifier and if you'll notice here you've got four output tubes here right two for this push-pull pair and two for this push-pull pair but notice the cathodes here on these they come down number pin number three on the 6BQ files they're tied and they come down here to this point and they're tied with the um, cathodes of these two tubes and then so you've got all four tubes being biased here together and then you come down and if you'll notice it kind of feeds over there's a little bit of a uh, resistor network here for bias control um, kind of on the front end of the grids here um, but 
If you'll notice, these come over here and they tie across C93A, which is one section of a multi-can cap, uh, back to ground. But then it continues on over here through this connector um, to pin number two. Hmm, that's interesting. So part of my bias, cathode bias circuit, feeds through this connector into another part of the amplifier. And so if we scroll up until we get into the preamplifier section of this amplifier, which is not in the same chassis, um, you'll notice here is the male connector. And coming out of pin number two, which we were feeding into with the cathode bias, check this out. It comes over, feeds, and it goes through the heaters of four tubes in this unit, and then it ties to ground. So that's kind of interesting. So instead of using a cathode bias resistor here, what they have done is fed through here into this pin number two, then in through four filaments going to ground, and they're using the four filaments in those primary two and the preamp tubes as the cathode bias resistor. It's kind of odd, um, I have to say so. I'm, I'm usually a big fan of Fisher designs. I think Avery Fisher did some amazing stuff. This one, not so much. Um, here's the downside to this. So, if you take your cathode bias resistor and you happen to have an open filament in one of those four tubes, then you have lost your cathode bias resistor. And so basically at that point, your cathodes here are no longer tied directly to ground. Instead, they feed back through this other bias control circuit back to ground and it throws your bias all out of whack, which, back to what I mentioned earlier, just might toast your output transformer. So I would never design an amplifier in such that if a tube went out in one part of my amplifier, it may damage or fry a part in another part of my amplifier. So um, it's kind of what they did. It might have been part of some value engineering. I'm not exactly sure why they went down that path, but... Um, I would call it less than stellar uh, design. So we're going to have to replace the components that were in this other amplifier um, with something inside of this chassis, i.e. a cathode bias resistor. Um, and so we're not dependent upon this other unit. All right. Um, next thing, once we've addressed the output tube bias, we've got to set the driver to B plus properly. Well, let me show you what I mean by that. Okay, the driver tube here, which is the 7247s, both halves of it, one on each channel. If you'll notice, the B plus for each of these um, is kind of fed here, and it comes down and it feeds over here. But then if we scroll down, we notice that it comes over here and we're putting 290 volts here onto the plates through these uh, plate load resistors on each of the 7247s, feeding from right here. The issue lies in the fact that um, R110 here that we feed through goes over here to pin number one, okay? So pin number one on the other side in the other chassis kind of feeds down here, and you notice we've got 250 volts here, and it feeds over and it feeds the plates of quite a few other tubes here in this amplifier. Um, which kind of creates an issue because we don't have the same load that we used to have. We don't have all these other tubes being fed. So what we end up doing is to try to main, because if you think about, we got 320 volts here. Then we want to have a dropping resistor that gets us down to 290 right here. But from this 320 volt standpoint, there's a little bit of a voltage divider going on between what's here and what's in the rest of this circuit. Well, because we're not feeding the preamp, this R110 right here is really out of the picture. So what we end up doing is increasing the value of R123 right here so that we end up with the 290 volts that we intended to have right here to feed these other tubes. If we don't address this R123, this will end up sitting very, very high up here closer to 310, 315 volts, something like that, which is a little a little more than we want to feed the plates of these tubes with. So this is the, the second thing we've got to address. And when I get this video done, I'll recap with exactly the values that I ended up using to do these things with. I'll probably end up doing a little bit of trial and error uh, to figure that out. 
and um, once we get that nailed down I'll kind of make that part of the latter part of the video. So a couple things to note at this point. Um, first off, this is not your typical console lamp conversion. A lot of amp amps you pull out of an old console, really all you have to do are these things in step number five here, what I would call the normal console amp conversion. You need to put a power switch in it, um, you need to put some RCA jacks, you need to put some uh, speaker terminals on it, you typically need to recap the power supply. Um, sometimes you may have to address some uh, tone control, uh, tone shaping resistors and capacitors and whatnot. Typically you want to recap the coupling capacitors in these units. Typically you want to replace the power cord with a, uh, a three-prong cord. And so that's what you typically do in a console lamp conversion. This is not your typical console lamp conversions, and, and I can think of some others that are like this as well, where parts of the amplifier actually relied upon the preamp um, to do various things for it. So you, we have to go through these other steps here, uh, specifically three and four, to actually get to the part we can do a normal console lamp conversion on this. All right, up next, I've, I've been uh, conversing back and forth with the... Uh, the owner of this amplifier about a couple things. Um, first and foremost, um, you know, these can caps. Um, one of these, the one with the 60, 60, 100, we're actually going to disconnect and not use at all um, because we'll end up using a, uh, a separate 100 microfarad at 100 volts capacitor. So one of these gets connected. This one, though, on the other hand, um, which is a, I think, a 40, 40, um, 100 microfarad, that one we do have to use. And so I, what I asked the owner was, hey, do we, do we want to go down the path of getting like a, uh, a brand new cap for that? And um, you can get them. They're not exactly cheap. They get up in the $45, $50 with shipping plus range. And same with this one here. And the owner was kind of like, hey, um, you know, if we could save any money by just putting some caps underneath the chassis instead of replacing these. And, and I said, sure, we can go that route. Um, up next, his output tubes were not well matched at all. So um, we're going to put in a new set of uh, output tubes that are fairly well matched. And then the next conversation we've been having is really about what's the front of this amplifier and what's the back. So you've got, you got a logo here on the front with the Fisher. Really looks good from the front side. But then you got the power cord feeding into the front side. And then if you spin it around, you've got the entire... Um, back part here with absolutely nothing on it and these these units originally fed the speakers here and inputs here so what we've been talking about is let's uh, drill out the back here with the RCA inputs and the speaker outputs on the back side here and then let's relocate that power cord here on the back side and put a three prong cord and what that'll do then is it'll make this sort of the front of the amplifier and the tubes here would be facing whoever was uh, in the front of the amp, whoever was looking at it, which I think ultimately will give it the best look. So that's the route we're going to go down. And as you can see underneath here, these are really nice clean amplifiers. I like them a lot. Um, solid state rectified. But I can tell you right now, these uh, green coupling caps right here absolutely have to go. Um, no doubt about that. We'll check out a lot of the resistor values because these old are older carbon style resistors and make sure they're still within spec. And then we've got these 0 .0400, 0 .047 right here at 400 volts. Um, these are the old dog bone styles. Uh, I think they're uh, Mallory M's. They, um, they typically don't go bad, but just in case, I've got some brand new uh, 716P um, capacitors that we may put in place here. I'm gonna, I want to test them out first. And we've got a few spider webs underneath here, but in general, pretty nice uh, clean amplifier here. Just studying a little bit, I cut this, these wires loose here to the power um, to the power cord. I'm going to pull this power cord out and uh, I'm going to run it straight back here and go out the back side on here. But I was just looking at this, um, I got this little hole here where the original unit was. I think I might could round it out a little bit coming this way and uh, take advantage of that hole and just put the power switch right there on the front uh, and use that existing hole. That way we won't end up plugging it at all. Okay, I like to use a mechanical pencil or pencil of some sort and I've drawn a line. It's kind of hard to see. 
right down the middle of this amplifier on the back side here and it'll it'll be something that'll just rub right off uh, with ease. You can see it here a little bit. But that gives us a center line for uh, putting in the uh, output. So I'm going to come as close to the output transformers as I can get over here with the um, um, down in this section right here with the speaker terminals because then we'll be feeding right out of here into um, out of the power output transformers here into the speaker terminals and I'm probably going to drop the RCA inputs hmm it's a good question somewhere along in here um, I want to try to stay out of this power supply section up here if I can okay I've got a uh, IAC power cord you can pick these up I buy them on uh, lots of 20 or you can buy them for about two bucks a piece at your local Goodwill they're just computer power cords we're going to end up snipping one end off um, just got some good old, um, you know, red and black uh, speaker terminal jacks here, banana terminals. Um, RCA gold-plated input jacks, and you can see here, I usually buy these by the, by the dozens. Um, so we'll end up using two of those, or uh, either CL70, CL80 thermistor, we're going to end up using a little Heiko strain relief mount that will uh, help hold this cord in place. The good news on this unit, um, it's already got a fuse holder, so a lot of console amps won't have a fuse holder, and so that makes it pretty easy here for what we're going to have to do um, with the fuse holder. The other thing we'll have to figure out, there's probably some of these pins here that feed over and have the on-off switch. We'll have to figure out which ones of those to jumper, and then we'll end up feeding in as part of the power cord here. Oh yeah, that's what we're missing. We're missing a power switch. And I like these little rocker switches. They're pretty cheap. Uh, they're designed for 120 volts, and um, you can pick them up. I think I get a, uh, about six of them for ten dollars, something like that. And it's a three-quarter inch hole with a little notch on one side. You'll end up having to make with the Dremel. But the good thing is, once you get in there, it won't turn or move. Uh, they stay pretty snug. So uh, we're going to get to drilling on this thing. I did do a little bit of studying here on the back side. I'm going to put the speaker. Oh, can't see that, can you? I'm going to put the speaker terminals here, but then I noticed this little uh, capacitor I'm going to completely take out of circuit. That was the um, the 60-60-100 microfarad, and I'll end up using a standalone 100 microfarad somewhere else instead of right here. So with that out of the way, it gives me a good place right here to actually put the RCA input jacks. If you're trying to figure out how to drill these out, take all the um, washers off of it. And then you've got a little, nice little neat little guide right here that you can hold up here now and mark the centers of, and you'll know exactly how far apart to drill these. Okay, everything we're trying to do here we can do with a simple hand drill. I'm going to start out with a quarter inch bit here just uh, by hand. Um, and then I like to step up and use um, some of these, uh, I can't remember what they call them. I call them stepper bits, but there's another name for them. Um, and basically uh, jump up to the size we need then with this. I always like to put something down so that all the shavings end up uh, laying here and I can vacuum them up easily, but could get out the drill press and go down that path, but um, I think we'll be fine. You can see I've got my little uh, my little marks here on each of these and uh, we should be able to pull this off by hand pretty easily. Okay, as you can see I've got two holes drilled out now. Not worried about whether they're perfectly round because of this these uh, bits here will take care of that. What I did do after I drilled the first one though, I came back and checked the second one and I was actually off a little bit. So where I had started here, my bit had slid a little bit to the left. So in doing that, I redrew the second one to make sure I got these two spot on and uh, we're in good shape now. The main tip I would tell you is take this thing slow, uh, especially as you start going through it. You, want, you don't want to run this thing wide open. You'll end up Pulling your drill bit down through, puncturing all kind of components and whatnot. Just I take the whole thing slow at a you know, kind of pace like this. It'll take a minute to get through it, but at least you won't worry about uh, kind of chewing up on the other side or anything. Same thing here. I've got one drilled. I'm going to make sure my little hole in the center is still right, and it is on this one. All right. If you'll notice here, basically what I'm doing is taking it up onto the first, second, third, fourth little notch right here on this unit. And you just kind of go one, two. There we go. And it gets you up on the fourth notch and uh, turns out to be 
perfect for these little uh, units to mount into. They all turned out perfect. I'm uh, really happy with that. And if they're not perfect, you know, one set of holes is off a little bit, you can fix that as you uh, kind of mount these in place. you got a little bit of play on either side. Typically the back side of these holes will have some rough edges and you can either use a deburring tool here that would go around and come from both sides and uh, kind of cut off those edges or you can just use a Dremel and uh, hit it on the other side and kind of knock off those edges. Either one will work fine. Okay, on the RCA jacks, they're a little less forgiving than these are. These you've got a lot of play on them. But you, what you've got here is a washer and typically it mounts like this. And what this washer has is a little raised edge on it right here. And so you're going to want the, the hole to be exactly so that can fall inside of it. Um, let me show you. But notice the little raised edge and the holes I had drilled for the speakers. That fits right in there and will not slide left or right. Um, so the exact same size holes I've drilled here are what we're going to need over here. And if you'll remember, they were the fourth step up here on this bit. So I've done enough of these that I've gotten good at that. But for somebody starting out, getting that hole the right size, and uh, I, I can measure that other uh, thing for you and tell you exactly what size it is. Okay, this bit I'm using is a Greenlee 34403. And if I measure the, uh, the fourth step up, it's 0.433 inches is the size we're using. Okay, the more I studied trying to use this original hole and reaming it out bigger to the left here to put the power switch on the front, the more that is not going to work out well. It's just going to pull me back into that hole and due to the size, I'm going to end up over here into the edge of the chassis. So I'm going to end up picking up just a little black snap-in plug at Lowe's or something for right there. And we will, uh, we're going to position this thing on the back. So I end up using the shorter one here that gets wider. Um, and I got this hole here, and if you'll notice, this fits snug, except for there's a little notch on one side here that I have to use a Dremel tool to kind of uh, notch out on the side, and then this unit will drop right in. Okay, when mounting speaker jacks, one tip I will give you, um, before you go to tightening the nuts down on the other side, make sure you back these out um, and loosen these on the other side. Otherwise, You'll end up binding them up, uh, and you won't ever be able to unloosen these. So uh, loosen them, tighten these down, and then you can put these back down. Alright, and then the last thing you want to do is uh, just put your multimeter on continuity. I've clipped uh, here to the chassis. And you want to go through and make sure you touch the inner parts of all of these to make sure that you, know, you don't have connectivity to the chassis. And you want to check the outer parts of these and there's no continuity to the chassis. And as you can see here, I've got the uh, power switch now mounted in right here. And I've got the power cord with a little Heiko strain relief um, ran in here and the cord's long enough to get to what I need to on there. So we're ready to now get it back on the bench and start um, uh, replacing capacitors, rebuilding the power supply, wiring all this up, and uh, getting this unit converted. Okay, let's take a look at the uh, power supply and what we're going to have to do. If you'll notice, it feeds in here from the wall through this power plug. One side of this power plug comes down, goes through a fuse, and then ultimately feeds to one side of the power transformer. The other side, on the other hand, though, feeds down here. It kind of follows this jumper along, and it goes all the way over here, and it feeds into pin 4, which goes into this connector and then feeds into the other part of the chassis here and if you'll notice here pin 4 feeds down it goes through two switches first switch number two and then ultimately it goes through switch number three and it feeds back up here through uh, pin number seven and if we scroll back down here and take a look then um, pin number seven then feeds over across and into the other side of the power transformer so two things we need to do to uh, kind of make this unit work First, we need to jump our pins 4 and 7 here. Um, that completes the loop. The problem is, at that point, we have no power switch in line anywhere. So we can either insert a power switch in line here on this leg. And typically, you would want to do that between the fuse and the power transformer here. That way, if something were to short inside your switch, at least it would still get fused. Um, the other option you could have 
is between number jumpers number four and seven here, or somewhere along this line feeding uh, between here over and into the power transformer. Um, we could switch the other side. Technically they will both work. Uh, the one that's a little safer would be to fuse uh, to put the power switch right in here. Okay, let's take a look at the way the original power um, cord came in. It came into right here, which is the center of the fuse. And then what happens is it feeds out the other side of the fuse here into this black wire that I'm lifting up. This black wire comes over and goes right into the transformer at that point in time. Uh, as you can see here, it feeds right down in there. Then it kind of comes out the other side of the transformer here and it comes over to this pin. I think it's pin number three. Um, and then what happens is um, via a switch that's over in the other unit, it um, feeds back in then through this pin, and this little black wire here that ultimately comes back over. It's a little tough to see here. Um, there you go. You can see it. Black wire comes back over and then feeds to the other side of the power. So it kind of completes the whole loop here. Well, I'm not wanting to just jump her from here to here, which I see done a lot of times. Um, I'm going to clean all this up. I'm going to disconnect these two switch uh, places. I doubt anyone would ever use them. It just kind of cleans up this area and I'm going to disconnect some of these uh, wires going into this uh, external feed here because they're really not needed. And we're going to wire this thing up. Um, I've got power cord here and let me zoom out here. Okay, I'll just follow the typical uh, way I do these. You kind of bring your, and I don't have an IAC connector on the back, but your black wire here will be hot. You bring it over to the middle of the fuse. You'll come out the other side of the fuse. We're then going to take it into the switch. We're going to come out of the switch. We'll go into one side of the transformer. We'll come out the other side of the transformer and come over here with the white uh, neutral wire. And then we'll also take the green wire here that comes uh, in on the power cord and we'll take it as close as we can. Um, to where it comes into the chassis back here, and we'll kind of ground that at that point in time. Okay, we've got it wired up now. Uh, coming in here, black wire over to the center of the fuse here. Coming out the other side of the fuse, running around all the way over to the switch. Coming out the other side of the switch into the power transformer here. And then coming out the other side of the power transformer back over here, and I spliced in between the... Uh, white wire and that um, and soldered that and put some heat shrink over it. So we should have the power wired up at this point. Got a little noise filter cap here I'm going to replace that goes between the uh, the input here and, uh, and ground. Okay, I'll replace these two old um, uh, paper and kind of wax plastic um, capacitors that are typically bad with some new polycaps. I'm a big fan of these Panasonic polycaps. They do a great job. Um, so one kind of goes between the outer um, part of the uh, fuse holder and ground over here and then one kind of goes from this uh, center point here on these two diodes over to ground. Okay, we're still kind of grinding along on this amp. I've mounted in here a um, 100 microfarad at 100 volts um, to replace the one section of this cap. Uh, if you remember, the other two 60s and six, 60 and 60 here weren't used anymore. Um, I've dropped in a 100 microfarad at 450 volts here to replace the this whole cap up top. And now I'm starting to replace sections on this one. It's 100 microfarad here at 450 volts. And then I've got to put in uh, two of these 47 microfarads at 400 volts um, on this side. If you notice, I've broken away some of the leads down in here to make some room here for me to actually uh, mount these capacitors in there. Okay, I went ahead and got these 247 microfarads put in here. I tied them to the same ground point, ran a black wire from that ground point over to this ground point that I've tied these two together. Even though they're tied to two different chassis ground points, I wanted to still run a wire between them to keep them at the exact same potential and not have any ground loops there. And I went ahead and put in this 15k ohm dropping resistor here, replacing the original 2.2k. In some schematics it shows it as 2.7k, in others it shows it as 2.2. This one happened to be a 2.2, uh, but that helps with what we had talked about earlier, the section and the other part of the amp that's no longer there, so we have to drop the voltage a little more than we originally did. 
So at this point it's a matter of wiring up the speaker outputs and the RCA inputs. Alright, one of the things I forgot to do earlier was wire in the thermistor. So I came off of the, uh, the other side of the fuse holder and uh, kind of wired it in series here and put a little heat shrink tubing on it. Okay, I tested all four of these and one of them was showing leaky. So I didn't want to leave um, three of this type in and put one of a different type in. So I just went ahead and replaced all four of those with some 716P um, orange drops at this point. Um, I just feel better knowing that all of them are replaced and that uh, they're all the same uh, type and that uh, if one of them was leaky maybe down the road uh, others would become leaky. So, Okay, a couple things we've done. Um, we've wired the output or the input jacks here over to these two points right here where the original input jacks came from. I thought about taking them straight down to the tubes but there's a couple resistors and various things wired uh, including ground over here to this uh, socket so it just made it cleaner to, to kind of tie these back into the original locations. The other thing I've done is I've mounted this uh, 25 watt uh, 560k ohm resistor right here on the uh, faceplate using an existing hole and then I took a point from one side of it and I took it over here to ground and then the other side of this goes down here and ties to the uh, cathodes that's in series on all four of these tubes. In other words, in parallel with this, uh, I think it's C93A, um, yeah, C93A right here, uh, which is the 100 microfarad capacitor. If you can see, it kind of comes over and ties to um, all four of these. And then there's another part of that that comes over here ties off on this pin and then comes back through this resistor here for a little bit of an adjustment on it. Uh, but we're making progress. Now we've got to get the outputs wired up. Okay, at this point I went ahead and tied in the, uh, the left channel here to the B side here and the right channel here to A. And we kind of tied into the original binding post um, for the reasons of all the feedback loops and whatnot were uh, tied in here on these points as well and it just uh, made the conversion a little simpler for you. Okay at this point I've uh, brought the unit up on a variac very slowly and uh, nothing caught on fire thus far. <laughs> um, I, I am measuring the voltages in a couple places right now and um, what I found was this 2.2k here that I said replace with a 15k. I was actually wrong on that. The 15k was right here. I'd already done that. But I went back with the 2.2k here and I realized it was still it was a little high on the other side. Um, this actually feeds pin 9 on all these tubes which is one of the screens. And um, so I ended up with a 3k ohm resistor right here in this place. A 7 watt resistor. And the 15K over here worked out just fine for getting the voltages that I wanted throughout the amplifier. So um, I'll document that in the last little document that I put together. Um, and we'll show that before we close this thing out. So um, I haven't hooked any audio up to it. Let's see how it sounds. Okay, I'm just feeding it basically with a 1 uh, kilohertz sine wave out of the function generator. And at this point, um, it's looking pretty good. It, uh, it drives really solid here all the way up uh, somewhere around 1920 volts. I start to see the slightest little bit of crossover distortion here. I'll make it a little more pronounced so you can see it, but uh, it's actually as far as I can drive it without. Whoop, there we go. So you can start to see the crossover distortion here. But if I back it back down, Right there around 19. So wow, that would be a uh, pretty decent output. Yeah, that's 11.25 watts um, there on the output. We're going to disconnect it here and hook it up over here on the uh, HP8903. Okay, right here we're driving uh, 9 watts out on this amplifier and we're less than 1% distortion at this point. And that's with uh, 17 volts peak to peak here. It's looking pretty good so far. Um, drop it a little bit harder here. 
and we get up to a percent and a half distortion and then at that point probably up in the 10 watt uh, 11 watt range on this little amplifier and that's per channel um, pretty solid uh, see what we get up here on the 3582 even at full output I mean there is the teeniest tidiest little blip here at 3 kilohertz but nothing um, nice and clean on the harmonic scale this may be the most impressive uh, stat yet check this out um, on a square wave look at that it's absolutely beautiful there's no overshoot there's no ringing the transients are nice and tight there's no slope to the actual um, uh, square wave itself wonder how hard I would have to drive it to start getting some of that wow this thing's so solid and uh, way on up there starting to get a little bit of rounding off around 11 kilohertz <laughs> so uh, this thing's actually pretty beautiful it's one of the better square waves I've, I've honestly ever seen on a uh, on an amplifier here. Yeah, I'm actually pretty happy with how this uh, amplifier turned out. Um, you see, I've been measuring voltages at various places here in this amplifier just to make sure that the uh, kind of the uh, plate voltages are good where they should be. The uh, screen voltages, the um, cathode bias. Um, on this amplifier. It's all uh, checking out pretty darn well. Alright, I think this thing is uh, pretty close to headed back to the customer. I've only got two things I would like to do to it uh, before I send it back. One's get a little chrome plug or black plug to go right here to cover up where the original power cord is. And two, I'm going to put some little bitty rubber feet underneath this thing all the way around. Um, but we'll do that uh, after we test it out for a full day. So anytime I work on something for someone, I like to let it burn in and play for pretty much a whole day. Because if you don't, um, you know, problems that could creep up an hour into it or whatever just don't show up. So it's kind of the way I uh, go about it. And uh, I've had a lot of fun doing this amplifier, I'll be honest. Uh, it's been a while since I've done a Fisher unit. And uh, even though these uh, have fairly small little output transformers relative to the SA-16, uh, this thing sounds amazing. And uh, these are both running really cool. The tubes, not so much, uh, but the L84s are known, uh, they just they put off heat. <laughs> and the power transformers running good and cool as well. Okay, just walking you through the steps that I took. Um, Notice the 440A and 490 are slightly different schematics. The amps are pretty much the same. You need to study their schematics because I'll give you an example. Something that may be called R123 might be called R125 in one of these other amplifiers. But in general, pretty much the same amps. Um, second thing I noted, you really need to run good matched quad of output tubes. Uh, all four of these tubes have their cathodes tied together. Um, to a single bias resistor and so it's very important that you're um, kind of running uh, match quads there. Um, next I had to change the output to bias a little bit and the way you do that is um, basically it says here the output tubes are tied through pin 2 of an umbilical cord to the preamp then those cathodes are tied through the preamp heater tubes uh, or tube heaters to ground um, using the heaters as bias resistors. We talked about that earlier. So you, you must replace this with a 400 to 560 ohm 20 watt resistor. Um, the 400 ohm would run this a little hotter. The 560 ohm a little less hot. I chose to go with the 560 ohm. Um, and you end up putting this in parallel with C93A, the 100 microfarad, 100 volt capacitor that I showed you earlier. Um, you got to set the driver to B plus properly, so we replaced the 2.2K 2 watt R123 resistor with a 15K 1 watt resistor. We also replaced that larger 2.2K 7 watt resistor R126 with a 3K 7 watt um, resistor. And then from that point, everything is what you would normally do in a tube console conversion. So, um, you know, the jumper connectors are, are like we did. We just kind of rewired the way the whole power supply worked. 
um, replace, put in a power supply, a um, power switch, put, replace the power supply caps, put in RCA input, speaker outputs, thermistor in line, replace your coupling caps, check resistors, all those things you would do in a normal conversion um, should get you there. If you got questions, feel free to uh, email me, mw at blueglow.net. I don't have as much time as I would like to reply to YouTube video uh, comments down below the videos. I get like 50 of them a day and I just can't keep up with them. So if someone's got a, uh, a comment, um, shoot me an email. Thanks for watching everybody and uh, if you want to, um, you can hang around. I'm going to play a song through this thing, three or four minute song. Otherwise, you can consider this a wrap for you. And uh, I had a lot of fun making this video and working on this app. I hope you did uh, watching this video. Thanks everyone. All right, if you want to hang around, I'll play you a song um, off of uh, what was Grim 19. It's a band called The Low Counts uh, out of Mount Airy, North Carolina. But unfortunately, one of the two members passed away last year. So uh, I'll just kind of play this uh, in uh, respect for those guys.
thanks for watching everybody. I had a lot of fun with this video and I uh, hope you did as well.